This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So we had a question from a viewer about when it becomes copyright infringement if you contribute to a software cracker. Here is someone named Empress, or they've titled this Empress, I guess it's their name, doesn't like DeNuvo very much. I, I happen to agree, I don't like DeNuvo very much either. I think it's really, I think piracy is a real interesting issue and DRM is a real interesting answer to the piracy question. We're going to implement restrictions in the paid version of our software against the people who are paying for the software. They're going to have to suffer lower frame rates and higher CPU usage so that we can prevent people who don't pay for our software. I get it. I get it. But I, you also have to remember you're hurting your paying users by doing that. So uh, I, I saw a real interesting talk a few years ago where DRM should really only be used during the initial release of a new popular product and then quickly removed uh, about two to four weeks later when the pro product's popularity drops off. So during the initial popular period is when there is a spike in piracy and then the piracy drops off a bit as you as you wait longer and longer. Now, this is a chicken and egg problem. I'm sure that if they implemented a policy like that, piracy could just wait a few weeks. But they actually did an extensive study and realized that that it, the piracy dropped off as well, even if the DRM was removed a few weeks later. But I digress. We're talking about whether or not when you contribute to this person, they have a Bitcoin address and they have an Ethereum address and they have a Monero address. I am looking for serious sponsors who can support my work so I can calmly continue doing what I do. Any sponsor can contact and etc. And so if you contribute to this person, are you committing contributory copyright infringement or just copyright infringement at all? So I thought we could look up a case or two on contributory uh, copyright infringement. So what I'm doing is going to a legal research system called FastCase, and I'm going to type in contributory copyright infringement. And it's going to give me uh, a list of cases and then tell me how many times those cases have been cited. And so I'm going to click on the, the, the two top ones. Oh, hey, look at this. Cobbler Nevada v. Gonzalez comes up in the in the as the as the first one. And I think I'm safe showing you this part. A bare allegation that a defendant is a registered subscriber of an IP address associated with infringing activity is not sufficient to state a claim for direct or contributory copyright infringement. So now we're not going to read the whole case of Cobbler Nevada, but what it's about is these lawsuits where they, where the plaintiff doesn't have anything more than the IP address. They allegedly see infringement on an IP address. How in the world can they do that? Well, some of these piracy programs, uh, or should I say programs that are used for piracy, don't want to defame BitTorrent. BitTorrent has a lot of very useful legal things you can do with it. But um, if you use BitTorrent to commit copyright infringement, like the Pirate Bay or something like that, um, it shares your IP address as it downloads. So you need to be behind a VPN or through a Tor endpoint or something. And that's not legal advice because I'm sure somebody is going to be the first one to get caught even though they were behind a VPN or something. And I've definitely had clients who did use a VPN, still got caught, but they were explaining to me that uh, well, the VPN failed that one time and I didn't have it set up properly. The proper way to set up a VPN is that when it fails, it disconnects you entirely, not just the VPN, but you don't get any data through. You don't get any traffic through if the VPN gets disconnected. If you don't have that set up, then you just exposed your IP address and now a potential plaintiff can sue you. Well, what they do is they sue your IP address uh, as a John Doe user of the IP address. And then they ask the court to allow a subpoena to uncover your identity. That's how we got here to the Cobbler Nevada case. And the Cobbler Nevada case said that, no, that's not enough. You need something more 
than just an IP address. You need something that identifies a particular person. An IP address is not a person. An IP address is a connection, and we don't know how many people are behind the connection. Even if we can later find out that it's only one person behind the connection or, or only five people behind the connection, that doesn't mean that you get to then conduct an investigation after the fact. You have to know something more before the fact. And I've cited this case heavily in my motions to quash and other oppositions to uh, Strike Three Holdings and Malibu Media and other copyright trolls efforts to continue to get people's identities. So, but we're gonna use this case now to find out what is the definition of contributory copyright infringement. So I'm just going to do a quick find here. A claim for contributory copyright infringement requires allegations that the defendant is one who, with knowledge of the infringing activity, induces, causes, or materially contributes to the infringing conduct. And this is quoting Fonavisa and Cherry Auction, Fonavisa v. Cherry Auction here, and Gershwin Publishing versus Columbia Artists Management. So let's take a look at those two cases and see what they stand for. All right, so now we've got those two cases, and let's do the same kind of find uh, deal here. This is a copyright and trademark enforcement action against operators of a swap meet or flea market where third-party vendors routinely sell counterfeit recordings. So this, this is a much closer uh, definition of contributory copyright infringement for uh, the Cracker case. Let's take a look. Contributory infringement is merely a species of the broader problem of identifying circumstances in which it is just, as in justice, to hold one individually accountable for the actions of another. Contributory infringement originates in tort law and stems from the notion that one who directly contributes to another's infringement should be held accountable. In other words, the common law doctrine that one who knowingly participates in or furthers a tortious act is jointly and severally liable with the prime tort feaser and is applicable under copyright law. What does that mean? What does it mean to be jointly and severally liable with a prime tort feaser? So joint and several liability means that several people may have committed an act, you know, one act of infringement in this case, or you know, one or, or more, acts of infringement, and they are all equally liable. So if I do it, and Tack does it, and Brandon does it, and Kurt does it, um, but it's all one act of contributory copyright infringement or, or, basic, or direct copyright infringement, then we are all liable. Now, that's four people who are all liable. So let's say that the damages are $100,000. Does that mean that they get $100,000 from each of us? No, it, but it means that we each owe $100,000 all of it up until the point that the plaintiff gets their $100,000. So joint and several liability simply means that you spread the liability around and everybody is fully liable for the act up until the point of that the that the person or plaintiff that the injured party gets gets full restitution or full compensation. So what happens then like if they get the hundred thousand from Len but not from but nothing from Kurt and the others maybe I have a claim against them to get you know the the portion from them I, I don't think so but you know maybe that's the best you can do is I could go after them for not having paid their portion or whatever but that was just, that's as far as it goes like there's no other remedy at law for me now where they got the hundred thousand from me or whatever so that's joint and several liability. What is a prime tort feaser? The that's the that's the person committing the act. That's that's so so in this case that's the cracker uh, empress or, or whoever is is doing the software cracking. That's the direct infringer. That's the prime tort feaser. Tort feaser is just a weird way of saying the person who commits the tort. So let's continue. Contributory infringement has been described as an outgrowth of enterprise liability which I guess means that the company is responsible for the acts of the employee, uh, respondeat superior, in other words, of saying that. Not sure if that's exactly what they mean here. And imposes liability where one person knowingly contributes to the infringing conduct of another. The classic statement is the doctrine in Gershwin. One who, with knowledge of the infringing activity, induces, causes, or materially contributes to the infringing conduct of another may be held liable as a contributory infringer. So let's take a look at what Gershwin has to say. 
So this is Gershwin Publishing Corporation, and this is from ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, brought copyright infringement claims against Columbia Artist Management to determine whether they're liable for and can be compelled to pay license fees when musical compositions in the ASCAP repertoire are performed at concerts sponsored by local community associations promoted by the Columbia Artist Management. In this test litigation, Cami concedes that 1965 concert artists managed by it performed Bess, You Is My Woman Now, I'm assuming that's a George Gershwin song. It sounds like a George Gershwin tune. Uh, publicly for profit at a concert sponsored by the Port Washington Community Concert Association. Cami takes the position that, that infringing performance did not render it jointly and severally liable. In other words, it did not contribute to the copyright infringement. The district court granted summary judgment for plaintiff upon finding that Cami the defendant had caused the copyright infringement by organizing, supervising, and controlling, and we, the appeals court, affirmed. So let's do the same thing here. We're going to find the word contributory. One who, with knowledge of the infringing activity, induces or materially contributes to the infringing conduct of another may be held liable as a contributory infringer. In Screen Gems Columbia Music Inc. v. Mark Fi Records, the district court held that an advertising agency which placed non-infringing advertisements for the sale of infringing records, a radio station which broadcasts such advertisements, and a packaging agent which shipped the infringing records could be held liable as a contributory infringer if it were shown to have knowledge or reason to know of the infringing nature of the records. Their potential liability was predicated upon the common law doctrine that one who knowingly participates in or furthers a tortious act is jointly and severally liable with the prime tort feaser. So now we're leaving copyright law and going into tort law. Now, copyright infringement is actually a subset of tort law. Copyright infringement is considered a tort or wrongdoing that causes an injury that is redressable by law. And so the common law doctrine means we don't even need a case on it. It is an sort of ancient or established uh, basic principle of law that one who contributes to knowingly participates or furthers a wrongful act is liable jointly and severally along with the person who actually committed the act. Now, there is some kind of disconnect here. There is a way to disconnect this. If you don't have knowledge, actual knowledge, if you don't have foreseeable, uh, a, a, a foreseeable understanding of causing a wrongful act, so should have known is another way of saying that. So knowing should have known or willful blindness. If you don't have that, you probably aren't a contributory infringer. If I give money to my mother just because my mom asks me for a couple hundred bucks. OK, great. If I give money to my mother and then she uses that money to help pay for her cracking activity so she can go break De Nuvo on the latest De Nuvo protected game, um, which 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 um, which application, which game was the one recently where De Nuvo was actually turned off in a, in a separate uh, I think it was was it Doom Eternal. I think it was Doom Eternal has a non de novo exe executable file in the original package that shipped with it. It wasn't the exe that was used to, to execute the game by default, but if you found it and put it in the right place, you could execute a non de novo protected version of Doom Eternal. They just left it in there. So if my mother takes my $500 and goes and uses that to support her cracking of the Nuvo in Doom Eternal, am I contributory liable? No, not unless I knew she was doing that, gave her the money for that, should have known that's what she does, and so I'm giving her money for that, um, or I'm willfully blind, like there was a reason why I should have seen it coming and I didn't. Um, you know, I, I knew she was doing it, but I, I took steps to be, you know, plausible deniability. If that can be proven in a court of law, then yes, I could be held contributory liable jointly and severally. So that does mean 
JCS. Long, long answer to your question, but that does mean that if you contribute to this cracking of De Nuvo and impressing all pirates across the sea, if you do contribute to that person for the purposes of cracking, you know, they're looking for serious sponsors here who can support my work and the work is cracking. Any sponsor can contact me, etc. If you provide money to that person, specifically knowing that they're going to be using it for cracking, and that's provable at a court of law, and later on that person gets sued for copyright infringement, you could be brought in as a contributory infringer, jointly and severally liable for the entire damage award. And that is the kind of copyright infringement that would be considered, you know, maximum damages or at least higher than minimum damages for that kind of cracking, uh, especially now that it's for the profit of having supporters and sponsors and things. So yeah, don't contribute to a cracker unless you are willing to take that chance. I 100% I agree that DRM is overbearing, overbroad, and, uh, and immoral in many senses. Um, I might use DRM on a game of mine or a product of mine, a book or movie or something, if I, if I felt that it was going to be heavily pirated. But you have to tailor the digital rights management to the the understanding that you're doing this to your to your core user base like so leonard french buys his games i i buy my games off of steam for the most part i try to avoid the epic game store because i don't like some of their practices for example buying rocket league and then disabling the mac and linux clients i mean that's just that's just terrible like why why would why why would epic buy psionics and then take away the ability of mac and linux users to play the game Come on, that's just that it was working fine before, but no, you have to you have to take it away. So I don't understand that, but so I try to buy my things on Steam. I know that Steam isn't perfect either. Nobody's perfect. You can really only make a decision within a within a narrow spectrum these days. So I try I try to purchase like paid for more or less full price, full sale price copies of these things. So why should I have to suffer lower frame rates in Doom Eternal and higher CPU usage and bugs caused by De Nuvo when I, I didn't want De Nuvo? I, I didn't want De Nuvo at all. I wanted the game. I wanted the core game. Give me the core game. I paid for it. And if you need something to prevent piracy, use something less intrusive. I, I would agree to digital watermarking. I would agree that my copy of the game should have a unique identifier in it so that if I leak my game to the internet without DRM, that it, they know that, that Leonard French did it and they can sue Leonard French. Companies that host videos could do the same thing, put a digital watermark in the video file so that if someone copies the video file and puts it up on the Pirate Bay with BitTorrent and all that, that so that they could be tracked back to a specific user. I believe Apple does this with their uh, AAC iTunes music files. So that if someone leaks a unprotected or, or cracks a AAC, that still there is something in the audio that can be read and give a unique identifier that allows them to track back to the original Cedar, S-E-E-D-E-R, Cedar of the, uh, of, of the, the BitTorrent you know, uh, file share. I'm not saying that I'm completely against DRM. Again, there's a spectrum here, a fairly narrow spectrum, and you, you kind of got to decide where you are for yourself within the spectrum. I also completely understand why developers and publishers are trying to prevent piracy because that can be a significant amount of lost revenue if you could convert those pirates into paid, uh, paid users. And so there's, there's a, there's a, a whole bunch of different ways to approach that problem. I just happen to dis uh, to disagree with De Nuvo because De Nuvo has bugs. It slows down the game. It seems to be an expensive thing to put in the game, which raises the cost of of providing the game. So I I, I don't I happen to not like De Nuvo. I think there are other solutions. There are less intrusive DRM solutions, is what I'm trying to say. And then, of course, there's the argument about whether or not piracy actually contributes to lost sales or whether it actually contributes to the popularity of something. I mean, were people who wanted to pirate, are they going to pay anyway? I think there's a, I think there's only a small, my personal opinion is that only a small subset, maybe like 10% of pirates 
So piracy is also a small subset of people who actually pay. So let's say that piracy is only 10 to 20 percent of the popularity of a, of a, of a game. Um, another only 10 percent of the 10 or 20 percent. So only one or two percent of a game's users are pirates who could be converted to sales. And I, don't, I think that that's insignificant, so insignificant that you shouldn't be punishing the other 80 to 90 some percent of your paying customers. Anyway, that's the answer to your question, JCS. I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. That's what contributory copyright infringement is. Just to be clear one more time, contributory copyright infringement is one who, with knowledge of the infringing activity, induces, causes, or materially contributes to the infringing conduct of another, and they may be held jointly and severally liable at the same level as the direct infringer. Let us know what you think in the comments below. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Please leave your comments in the comments below. Please like and subscribe if you like what I do. Please hit the dislike button if you dislike what I do. That also helps the channel. If you really did dislike it, uh, that at least shows user engagement. So thank you to those of you who support our channel financially on patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsors.com slash law. This channel would not exist without your financial support. Thank you to our $50 plus supporters in the month of April. Wes Delge, Video Quarantined, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Michael Pierce, Jan Negray, Daniel Perez, Aspernari, Joe Tyson, Benjamin Hightoff, Stephen Ada, Cute Grills in Your Area, Longreach Jones, Zachary Cheney, Nicely Done Defense, Wesley Mullen, Mullen PC, Sean McNamara, Josh Baker, Ugly Grill, Gregory, Shiloh T, Michael Moore, and Beastman. And the $5 plus supporters are on the LED panel next to me here and will be scrolling on the screen in front of me. And you're all in the description of the videos that drop. I'll let you go. I love you all. Have a great one. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Wash your hands. Shelter in place. Wear your masks if that's what the CDC and the uh, Surgeon General and the uh, WHO are now saying. Just stay safe and healthy, everybody. We'll get through this together. Love you all. Bye.